this. Okay, four. What is the reason for the heaviness one feels when annulling before the creator in the work? We must know the reason for the heaviness felt when one wishes to work in annulling oneself before the creator and to not care for one's own interest. One comes to a state as if the entire world stands still and he alone is now seemingly absent from the world and leaves his family and friends for the sake of annulling before the creator. There is but a simple reason for this called lack of faith. It means that one does not see before whom one nullifies, meaning he does not feel the existence of the creator. This causes him heaviness. However, when one begins to feel the existence of the creator, one's soul immediately yearns to be annulled and connected to the root, to be contained in it like a candle in a torch without any mind and reason. However, this comes to one naturally as a candle is annulled before a torch. Does that make sense to everybody so far? Kind of basically having like equivalence of form as we're building, um, you know, uh, the lack of faith means one does not see before whom one nullifies, meaning, you know, um, it, I want to nullify my ego, but if I'm all ego, how do I know to nullify it? Because that is me, right? I, I want cake. I want cake now. Why should I not have cake? Well, I, I want cake, so why should I not? Because... It's obviously this, we haven't built this separation yet, and this is the beginning, so go ahead. Okay. And <clears throat> it therefore follows that the essence of one's work is only to come to the sensation of the existence of the Creator, meaning to feel the existence of the Creator, that the whole earth is full of His glory. This will be one's entire work, meaning all the vigor that He puts into the work, work will be only to achieve that and not for any other things. One should not be misled into having to acquire anything. Rather, one should not be misled into having to acquire anything. Rather, there is only one thing a person needs, namely faith in the Creator. He should not think of anything, meaning that the only reward that he wants for his work should be to be rewarded with faith in the Creator. We must know that there is no difference between a small illumination and a great one, which a person attains. This is because there are no changes in the light. Rather, all the changes are in the vessels that receive the abundance, as it is written, I, the Lord, change not. Hence, if one can magnify one's vessels to the extent he magnifies the luminescence. All right, does that make sense? If one magnifies one vessel to that extent, he magnifies the luminescence. All right, does that, does that uh, resonate with everybody on how, you know, we're building the desire and uh, we only know what we have attained, so... How do I attain this great knowledge? How do I attain uh, as being exotic? How do I attain even the level of Benoni? How can I, shit, how can I even be an incomplete Rasha? All I want to do is be an incomplete Rasha because that means I'm not completely evil, right? You know, there's these stages we go through and each stage um, in each world is uh, a different attainment. So I can attain Zadok in Asiya, but it doesn't mean I'm going to be that way in Bria Yitzhak in Asiya. You, you know what I'm saying? Um, if that makes sense, Philip. The, the light doesn't change. So what what is telling me is the quantity of light that is always expressed is always the same. What changes is the vessel, the vessel itself. So which is the desire, the will to receive. That uh, So the greater the desire, the greater the light get inside. And that's why they say that the, the light is not the one that does anything I mean, the quantity of light that one's going to receive. It's always only the vessel, the desire that is within me, that really permit me to get more or less. The smaller the desire I have, then I only get, according to that, the quantity of light. The bigger, then I get bigger. Okay. Thank okay. you. So yet, the question is, with what can one magnify one's vessels? The answer is, in the extent to which he praises and gives thanks to the Creator for having brought one closer to him. So one would feel him a little and think of the importance of that thing, meaning that he was awarded some connection with the Creator. As is the measure of the importance that one pictures for oneself, so the measure of the luminescence grows in him. One must know that he will never come to know the true measure of the importance of the connection between man and the Creator because one cannot assess its true value. Instead, as much as one appreciates it, so he attains its merit and importance. There is a power in that, 
since thus one can be permanently imparted this luminescence. <clears throat> okay, so uh, there's a power in that, since thus one can be permanently imparted this luminescence. So that means uh, basically once you've achieved a certain level of your desire, that's when you're going to be able to accept this power of the light or the strength of the light. Um, let's see, as is the measure of the importance that one pictures for oneself, so the measure of luminescence grows in him. So I have a desire, I have this image in my mind of this great chocolate cake, and um, it's going to drive me a certain amount of pleasure. We'll call it 98% of pleasure. And uh, when I go get this cake, I'm going to be starting to fulfill this this desire, and I'm going to fulfill this pleasure, and so on and so forth. And as time goes on, I end up building a stronger desire for this cake because I felt already how good it is inside of me. And so now I'm going to create a, a bigger desire next time once this desire is satiated. Uh, Philip, anything? Uh, so, somewhat uh, a little, come on. Because we, we were speaking before, right? Mm -hmm. We wanted to change the vessel. And the, the before the last paragraph, he's telling me what, what is it that I can do to magnify that vessel? And they really made it very simple because sometimes we may think that's well, how do I augment my desire? What What is that that I want more? And you have to tell me it is to the extent he praises and gives thanks to the Creator for I bring one closer to him. Which means when I recognize indeed that I'm getting something, that I'm getting an awareness of a Creator, that I'm getting closer to him, instead of feeling, wow, that feels so good, it's telling me to be able to augment it and not just lose it. I must say, thank God that he brings me closer and recognize his greatness. And by recognizing his greatness, I am getting more and more and more. Okay, number five. Lishma is an awakening from above. And why do we need an awakening from below? In order to attain Lishma, it is not in one's hands to understand, as it is not for the human mind to grasp how such a thing can be in this world. This is because one is only permitted to grasp that if one engages in Torah and Mitzvah, he will attain something. There must be self-gratification there. Otherwise, one is unable to do anything. Instead, this is an illumination that comes from above, and only one who tastes it can know and understand. It is written about that, taste and see that the Lord is good. Thus, we must understand why one should seek advice and counsels regarding how to achieve Lishma. After all, no counsels will help him, and if God does not give him the other nature, called the will to bestow, no labor will help one to attain the matter of Lishma. The answer is, as our sages said, it is not for you to complete the work, and you are not free to idle away from it. This means that one must give the awakening from below, since this is discerned as a prayer. Well, it's strange, right? Because he's telling me that I have to ask for the console, but he's telling me that even if I ask for the console, that does not help. But he's not come on, asking for others to be able to, how do you do for Lishma? It's not really something that I can acquire, because it's only from up above that it will be given to me. But knowing that fact, that indeed, no matter how much I will do, it is only from the grace of up above but I can receive anything. But I have to come up, I have to do my part. I have to be able, that desire that we were speaking before, that praising, that awareness, that desire, that yearning to be able to receive, I must have it. It's like, this is like an opening of a door. I open the door for it to come down. So from Lolishma, because in a sense, when I do it, I do it for my own sake. I want to be able to feel something. I want to be able to be close to God. And which is not for his sake, it is for my own, for so because I know that it is what I seek. And this is what from from that, from up above, it's rectified, it's corrected, then I can get from Lishma. Okay. Okay. A prayer is considered a deficiency, and without deficiency there is no fulfillment. Hence, when one has a need for Lishma, the fulfillment comes from above, and the answer to the prayer comes from above, meaning one receives fulfillment for one's need. It follows that one's work is needed to receive the lishma from the Creator only in the form of a lack and a cleave. 
yet one can never attain the fulfillment alone. It is rather a gift from God. However, a prayer must be a whole prayer, that is, from the bottom of the heart. It means that one knows 100% that there is no one in the world who can help him but the Creator himself. Iqbal, before we had another question, what, what does that mean, a prayer? And, and here again, it's really specifying it for me, but a prayer is not like a request. It's not something I'm requesting. It's that it is, the prayer is my yearning for me. If it is from the bottom of my heart, come on, it's a yearning that I have to be totally in it. I have to be fully wanting it so much, but that's not enough either. I have to recognize that there is nothing else that can really help me. Because sometimes we, we may want God, but really we're going to do a lot of things our own, thinking we can do our own part. Or I can ask from someone else to be able to help me. When I realize this, that is the deficiency. The deficiency is I don't have it my own self. Mm -hmm. And therefore I recognize that only Him can really help me. And this is really the true prayer. It's not like words and, uh, you know, and all the stuff that we can think and asking for all kind of stuff. It's really the yearning for for getting close to him. Right. So how do we okay. how do we do this? How do we uh, how do I have a prayer from the bottom of my heart? Do I go? Do I have to cry? Do I have to, you know, like what does that mean? Uh, this is obviously, uh, you know, um, I'm asking you know for everybody. Uh, this is a, a tough subject because in the beginning of the path, uh, I've only had a few, a very, very few real prayers. And it's something that an alchemist will tell you that transmutes you. And I believe it to be true because um, you will see actual physical manifestations um, uh, come about when you actually have a prayer like this. It's, I don't know, we want to call it God's signs of showing you is, is answering you or whatever it is you want to call it. Um, but the energy that you, you uh, emit when you're praying, uh, getting it to actually resonate from your heart, it, it, it's challenging. Because I could sit and I can listen to some um, Shema Israel and I can bear down and I can think of, with my mind, I can think of all these bad things that I've done and I've sinned and I could feel shame for them. But that's not really a prayer for reform in myself from my heart. That's me feeling shame because of all oh, the disconnection. I see the difference between my light and the Creator's light. So how can I have this full functional functional request from my heart for Hashem to actually come and, and start correcting these vessels? Building that first desire to want this prayer is is where we should all start to really focus and and really look through the texts that come through here like shamati says that, that's what we read we read this before right right he told me how can i magnify the light and this is a continuation in the sense of it what what is that the magnification what is that prayer in a sense and it is that recognition that i'm i'm thanking god come on it's not like a request it's a recognition of his power that he and he alone can really do anything for me. So it's not, uh, I understand the term, we cry for it, you know, because there is a lot of um, uh, language that we, we can try to understand, and we think it is really like crying or whining to God, hey, God, I'm here, what uh, the crap, I'm not, uh, you're not helping me, you know, I, I, I need you, and you're not seeing me, I am really crying, I really need you. That's not really that. But when, when, we, when we do prayers, let's say a regular prayer in a shul or in a synagogue or in a church or in a temple, that people connect to that God, this is, in a sense, a recognition of his greatness. It's like well, I, I am mostly recognizing that he is. Let's say if I go to a, a king or a president and I recognize the president, I recognize his power. I recognize that he's the one that can do things for me. And in a sense, this is what I think he call a prayer. And I think next he's going to go into it, what that means exactly, how to go totally with your heart. How does one know that, that there is no one to help him but the Creator himself? One can acquire that awareness precisely if he has exerted all the powers at his disposal and it did not help him. Thus, one must do every possible thing in the world to attain for the Creator. 
then one can pray from the bottom of one's heart, and then the Creator hears his prayer. However, one must know when exerting to attain the Lishma, to take upon himself to want to work entirely to bestow, completely, meaning only to bestow and not to receive anything. Only then does one begin to see that the organs do not agree to this idea. From that one can from that one can come to clear awareness that he has no other counsel but to pour out his complaint before the Lord to help him so that the body will agree to enslave itself to the Creator unconditionally, as one sees that he cannot persuade his body to annul his self entirely. It turns out that precisely when one sees that there is no reason to hope that his body will agree to work for the Creator by itself, one's prayer can be from the bottom of the heart. And then his prayer is accepted. Oh, yeah. I was just going to say, uh, only then does one begin to see that the organs do not agree to this idea. Okay, so this we see this in the corporeal and the spiritual. We see this everywhere. I love chocolate cake. Okay, I have my sensation, my brain, my stomach, everything. My teeth, though, if I only eat chocolate cake, my teeth are going to rot out of my face. Okay, this is how this works. This is how we start to learn the separation. I can't have these things. I can't have cake every single day because it's going to affect my fat. It's going to affect my 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 uh, lungs, my my uh, veins, my uh, arteries, my teeth. Everything else on my body doesn't agree with this good thing. But my brain and all these other things tell me it's good, right? So this is where we have to dis discern our nullification. And if we go down a little bit more, um, so this is what we pray. We want to we want to pray for His light and not feel shame by us accepting it. There is something very, I think, very important here that we're saying because really, it is not into my nature to be able to just want to give to bestow, right? So, so it means that it is a contradiction with what I want because really I want the light for me. Come on, no matter that I'm going to say, no, 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 I really want to be so to, to, but I have, I am, my nature is really to want it. So when I do that, it's only if I turn myself, it's that what we call before above reason, but I understand I am not capable really of bestowing at all or desire to bestow totally to creator. So I have to go above reason to understand that this is not coming really from me, but it only come from him. But there, there is uh, that the annually, uh, not to receive anything, only when does one begin to see that the organ do not agree with that idea. Because indeed, my whole body does not want to do that. My whole, my whole being is totally against it because my, most of my being is my animal soul, is my selfishness, is my ego. And I want it only for myself. I have to almost uh, lie to myself. I have to manipulate my ego to tell him, yeah, 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 you can want to bestow. Just desire it enough and you will see from up above it will come. And only from up above does really it's happening. But that awareness is come just from up above. I have to do my part in forcing myself, but the gift is really from the Creator. And the thing is that we have to be very careful when sometimes we think of a Creator is outside. It's something somewhere that I'm turning to. What is telling me, it's within my heart. It is in the depth of my heart. To the bottom of my heart is the true prayer. That's what sometimes we speak about the Nekuda in the heart, the point in the heart. This is that connection, that godly soul is within me. It's always been within me, and I have to be able to turn to it. I don't turn to something that is much outside of me. Like sometimes we think, you know, oh, God is in the heavens, and I'm down here, then I have to pray. It's like we spoke about the end self. It's everywhere, everything. And this is what the true prayer become when it's not an outside thing, but really an inside work. We must know that by attaining Lishma, one puts the evil inclination to death. This evil inclination is the will to receive, and acquiring the will to bestow cancels the will to receive from being able to do anything. This is considered putting it to death. Since it has been removed from its office, and it has nothing more to do since it is no longer in use, when it is revoked from its function, this is considered putting it to death. 
When one contemplates what profit hath man of all his labor wherein he labors under the sun, one sees that it is not so difficult to enslave oneself to his name for two reasons. One, anyhow, meaning whether willingly or unwillingly, one must exert in this world and what has one left of all the efforts he has made. However, if one works lishma, one receives pleasure during the work itself too. According to the proverb of the sayer of Dubna, who spoke about the verse, Thou hast not called upon me, O Jacob, neither hast thou wearied thyself about me, O Israel. He said that it is like some rich man who departed the train and had a small bag. He placed it where all the merchants place their baggage, and the porters take the packages and bring them to the hotel where the merchants stay. The porter had thought that the merchant would certainly have taken a small bag by himself, and there is no need for a porter for that. So he took a big package. The merchant wanted to pay him a small fee, as he usually pays, but the porter did not want to take it. He said, I put in the depository of the hotel a big bag. It exhausted me, and I barely carried your bag. And you want to pay me so little for it? The lesson is that when one comes and says that he has exerted extensively in keeping Torah and mitzvah, the Creator tells him, Thou hast not called upon me, O Jacob. In other words, it is not my baggage that you took, but this bag belongs to someone else. Since you say that you had much effort in Torah and mitzvah, you must have had a different landlord for whom you were working. So go to him and he will pay you. Because really, with telling me, like we, we spoke before, that many people, we can do the rituals, all the Torah and mitzvah, but it's feeding my own self. It is, look at me, I am doing it, I am a good religious person, I am, and all this is feeding my own. So I'm carrying my own big baggage. The Creator does not ask me really to carry a big baggage. He does not ask me when I do, when I do the mitzvah. I have to do the mitzvah, but I have to do it. The intention has to be for His service, not for my service. And so, when if I if I said this has been a hard work for me, in reality I haven't done it, because doing it, if I do something for lishma, is no work at all. It's joy. It's something that what we said we read also into uh, in uh, Rabban, uh, Rabbi Narman Mi Braslev, but it is with joy. So joy, it, I don't see it as work. If I enjoy, like when I go on vacation, and I love myself, do I call this work? I'm not because it's so joyful, and that's what they tell me. If I do it for the right reason, then it is joy, and the work is not really no more work. If you want to add anything, uh, Joe. Uh, also remember where Jacob is on the tree. Uh, I think that that might play a little significance into it too. You know, when we come to separate, um, when we come to separate the ego from the soul and, you know, the ego is sitting there telling you, dude, you did all this work. You need some reward, you know, and that's the, the complete wrong intention of anything. You know, we're, we're always going to be in Lolishma. Um, and that's what we're striving for is to be, uh, or to be in Lishma. And so uh, trying to acquire this sensation or trying to acquire this desire to do something for not reward, it, there, there's a couple separate things here. So we can, I can go and I could give somebody something purposely and not expect reward, but then to want to go give him something and not get reward. You know what I mean? I'm not going to, there's always going to be that, oh, well, what if I just go give him something and then maybe I'll get a reward? You know, there's still that thing in there that's, that's, oh, well, let's see what I can get. You know, there's, there's always that, that clipa there trying to pick over your shoulder like, oh, hey, did you get anything? Did you get anything from this? Oh, okay. Well, maybe next, you know, there's that thing in there. So you got to learn, we got to try to completely achieve the desire to want to bestow it this comes way before the the act you know uh, just like we were talking about tanya thought speech and deed once you uh, claim once you claim that desire to want to bestow that's when you can start living in lishma and wants to know okay so she asked does it fluctuate uh, yeah every moment every moment i fluctuate so in this moment i'm in a perfect environment to where I am now capable of giving and I could care less of receiving.
because my CLI is full and empty at the same time. I'm in a great state. I, there's no other purpose. I don't need to receive anything because whatever it is I have, I'm satiated in. All of my desires that are here right now, I'm satiated. I'm not hungry. Uh, I don't need sex. I don't need drugs. I don't need rock and roll. I don't need any of that. I'm okay. I'm good. So now since I'm in a comfortable state, now I can acquire this level of bestowing. Why? Because I'm comfortable. So once we come out of this and once we uh, build a stronger desire, once our vessel's emptied, we start to learn how to play with this light. Oh, okay, so now I'm now I'm not wanting to bestow because I don't have any more food in my cupboards. So instead of giving to this poor man who knocked on my door, I'm going to keep the food for myself because now I'm hurting. Now I'm struggling. So there's this level that we have to, we weigh this constantly in every moment. But since right now I'm happy, I'm in my home, I got food, I got everything I need, I'm going to bestow to everybody. I'm happy and I'm great and I'm loving everybody. I love it. But as soon as uh, my cupboards are empty and all of my clothes are gone and, uh, you know, Uncle Sam's knocking on the door wanting a paycheck, I'm probably not going to bestow all that much, am I? You know, so yes, we, we do fluctuate every moment, but this is how we need to understand <laughs> Uh, this is how we need to understand the creator testing us and the creator giving us and allowing us to work. This is our work. Our work is when our cupboards are empty and our food is gone that we still have the desire to bestow and understanding that this level is a new state. I'm in a new state now to where now I can overcome and completely bestow. Does that make sense? Bestowing doesn't have to be materialistic no it right. could be um hope and love and just saying i hope, want the best for you um but i yeah i'm just asking yeah. you okay <laughs> but but i think it's like what you said also before uh, joe uh -huh. but in all reality i am incapable of really giving if i let's say if i stop for one second mm. and i look at myself with the most honesty that i can and i try to think am i capable of doing something from someone else without expecting nothing in back. I can't. It is not possible at all. That's why we say that this is a gift from above. It cannot come from me. For me, it's the yearning. How much do I want? I want it. I realize it is not possible. That's why there's a prayer. But I realize that only the Creator can really give me that capability to feel the bestow. To feel to a total pleasure in bestowing. Because even even if I feel like even when you're saying on the number two, right? Mm. I, I give pleasure doing the work itself too, which means I'm getting something. Right. It, it is almost impossible to be a true altruistic in a sense. Right. And that's what I think they're saying here. But it is always, that's what you were trying to express, that it is always a motion and up and down. And like Anna was saying, it's not always material thing. I can give my time to someone. Mm -hmm. I can give listening to someone, right? I'm listening to, uh, if I am, and that's, that's why we need a great honesty with our own self to be when we scrutinize, to see what is our motive behind it, what is our intention. We, we're going to see that there is always something, we, we're getting something, a little maybe, but we're always getting something for our own. We're not capable of doing anything if there is not a rational reason for us to get something out of it. This is the meaning of neither hast thou wearied thyself about me, O Israel. This means that he who works for the creator has no labor, but on the contrary, pleasure and elated spirit. However, one who works for the other purposes cannot come to the creator with complaints that the creator does not give him vitality in the work, since he did not work for the creator, for the Lord to pay for his work. Instead, one can complain to those people that he had worked for to administer him pleasure and vitality. And since there are many purposes in Lolishma, one should demand of the goal for which he had worked to give him the reward, namely pleasure and vitality. It is said about them that they that make them shall be like unto them. Yea, yea, every one that trusts in them. However, according to that, it is per perplexing. After all, we see that even when one takes upon oneself the burden of the kingdom of heaven, Without any other intention, he still does not feel any liveliness. To say that this liveliness compels him to take upon himself the burden of the kingdom of heaven.
So this is this is saying that every, everybody goes through this. When you first start, you, you're cutting off this ego that has been leading you your entire life. And once you start cutting it off, you're like, whoa, wait a minute. This is not right. You're going to do what I say when I say it. And you're like, no, it's not for our good. You know, so like like Philip was saying, you got to you now you're in a you're in a debate with this thing. You're 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 trying to convince it. Look, uh, you will get a lot of pleasure. Just relax and trust me. But it's like, no, I want it now. And uh, this 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 is the war. This is the battle that we go through on every single moment of our life. And um, this is uh, having complete faith having trust in Hashem, you know, doing all this scrutiny and trying to stay connected all in the, at the same time is damn near impossible. And this is why we have the path. This is why we have the group. This is why we have the study. This is why we need, you know, uh, as we wake up in the morning, we already start to fill our vessel with corporeal things. The moment we open our eyes and, we have to constantly struggle for lishma. We have to, if we don't, we're going to just overfill with the corporeal desire and we're going to be screwed because we feed the bad soul and it's going to start getting more powerful and powerful and powerful. Trying to struggle and struggle and struggle and get, build this desire for the lishma. For lishma. Lishma, sorry. <laughs> okay. And the reason one does take upon oneself that burden is only because of faith above reason. In other words, one does it by way of coercive overcoming, unwillingly. This we might ask, why does one feel exertion in this work with a body constantly seeking for a time when it can be rid of this work, as one does not feel any liveliness in the work? According, according to the above, when one works in humbleness and has only the purpose of working in order to bestow, why does the creator not impart him taste and vitality in the work? The answer is that we must know that this matter is a great correction. Were it not for that, meaning if light and liveliness had eliminated instantaneously when one began, began to take upon himself the burden of the kingdom of heaven, one would have had liveliness in the work. In other words, the will to receive, too, would have consented to this work. So, yeah, that's kind of like what <laughs> I was just saying. You know, if I got the rule, see, it, it, oh, this is funny. It, once we start building the desire to bestow, we should be happy that we have this desire to bestow and, and see that as our pleasure. But we don't. We see bestowing, and what happens when we bestow is we start seeing our vessel get empty, which is completely bass backwards. That's not how we should live life. That's what the hell is wrong with the entire world, is that I came and I did your roof and I fixed your car today. You owe me. You know, and that's completely backwards. We should all be living in a huge village that is ran by all natural things that's completely bestowing to every single one of us. And we can all thrive, but we can't get there. We can't get there because of this ego and the dominance of it. Okay, so it, basically by not receiving the light right away, this is now the beginning process of our work you know we don't receive vitality in the work right now well why because if we did we do it for ego purposes so this is this is why it's you know uh, uh you know what is it reveal one concealed two you know that's just how it works it's like i found you behind one curtain you're gonna go hide behind two curtains it's just how how we keep our perception seeking him we gotta keep searching we have to keep searching if we don't we end up back in the egoistic state because the ego is still strong when if you get it right away you have it yeah control it yeah yet. yeah okay in that state he would certainly agree because he wants to sa sa satiate his desire meaning he would work for its own benefit had that been the case it would never have been possible to achieve lish lishma this is so because one would be compelled to work for one's own benefit, as one would feel greater pleasure in the work of God than in corporal desires. Thus one would have to remain in low lishma, since thus he would have had satisfaction in the work. Where there is satisfaction, one cannot do anything, as without profit, one cannot work. It follows that if one receives satisfaction in this work of low lishma, one would have to remain in that state. 
This would be similar to what people say, that when there are people chasing a thief to catch him, the thief too runs and yells, catch the thief. Then it is impossible to recognize who is the real thief so as to catch him and take the thief theft out of his hand. However, when the thief, meaning the will to receive, does not feel any flavor and liveliness in the work of accepting the burden of the kingdom of heaven, if in that state one works with faith above reason, coercively, and the body becomes accustomed to this work against the desire of one's will to receive, then one has the means by which to come to a work that will be with the purpose of bringing contentment to one's maker. And that, that's what we just talked about. Yeah. Right? So long as I'm able to have pleasure, enjoyment, when I work, then I have to tell myself that in all reality I am not doing it this month. But when I see that I am doing so much and I feel it like uh, I am still so far away, and that's why that prayer comes about, when I see that I am still so far away, that I cannot do nothing, but it is no matter how much I work towards it, then I receive from up above Lishma. Then I start to, re to recognize that this work against my desire is really what permit me to receive Lishma. And it is it, it's very difficult because we go, we, as soon as I receive a pleasure, my ego feeds from it. So it's like I, I cannot be in a constant state of always working Lishma. Most of the time I'm falling back down and going back up. That's what all those ascent and descents are all about. This is so because the primary requirement from a person is to come to Devakut adhesion with the Creator through one's work, which is discerned as equivalence of form, where all of one's deeds are in order to bestow. It is as the verse says, then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord. The meaning of then is the, that first, in the beginning of one's work, he did not have pleasure. Instead, one's work was coercive. However, afterwards, when one has already accustomed oneself to work in order to bestow and not examine oneself, if he is feeling a good taste in the work, but believes that he is working to bring contentment to his maker through his work, one should believe that the Creator accepts the labor of the lower ones regardless of how and how much is the form of their work. In everything, the Creator examines the intention, and that brings contentment to the Creator. Then one is imparted, then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord. Even during the work of God, he will feel delight and pleasure, as now one really does work for the Creator because the effort he made during the coercive work qualifies one to be able to work for the Creator in earnest. You find that then too, the pleasure that one receives relates to the Creator, meaning specifically for the Creator. However, afterwards, when one has already accustomed oneself to work in order to bestow and not examine oneself, if he's not feeling good in the state of the work, but believes that he is working to bring contentment. Okay, so right here, what they're telling us is that, okay, so we have to work to get to a state. All right. We have to work to first not examine ourself when trying to bestow so when i first go do something all right there's a, a friend and he needs a place to stay i'm gonna go give him a place to stay uh, because that's the nice thing to do and uh right as i'm giving him a place to stay the first thing i do is i calculate how much pleasure i'm going to receive either by giving him a place to stay or by what he's going to give me whether it be praise money um, whatever it is, I'm going to receive at some point in this exchange. And this is what this is talking about. Uh, not examine oneself while you're bestowing. This is a state that I don't think anybody can get to right yet. It's just the hardest thing on the planet because your mind and your ego, your calculating mind calculates every moment in time, how you're, you are going to receive from anything you do. So this is what we're working on. I'm going to say, if he is feeling a good taste in the work, but believes that he is working to bring contentment to his maker through his work, one should believe that the creator accepts the labor of the lower ones, regardless of how much, of how and how much is the form of their work. So this is talking about intention, the form of their work. What am I, what's the form of my work? My work is in my intention. My intention is to pour out everything I can so God can fill it. 
I'm relying, I'm trusting, a faith above reason, everything I'm doing is without self to service, service to self, and it's for Hashem. It's for somebody else. It's for anybody. But I'm not taking myself into consideration at all. And I refuse even now to accept light for the thing that I've done. So now that I let my friend in my house and sleep, and I'm not even going to accept praise. I'm not going to accept any joy now because I'm not doing it for me. There's nothing in it for me anymore. So, um, yeah, there's this one story Steve's got. He he was at a shul or a bar mitzvah or, or uh, not a bar mitzvah. What is a this? Wedding. Oh, yeah, a wedding. And um, the the first, uh, the, the, um, the, the rabbi and the, uh, the groom uh, were together. And the rabbi went and put tefillin on the groom. It was the first time ever. And uh, first thing, uh, you know, he did, he donned, donned the tefillin for him and uh, said his shuva or, or, or whatever it is they say. <laughs> I'm not up to date on the Jewish. But, um, you know, did all that. And then uh, Razi comes and, you know, once the rabbi walks away, Razi comes and said, hey, man, you know, that was a really good thing you did. And the rabbi looked at him and goes, ah, oh, like in just, you know, just discontentment. The rabbi didn't want praise for what he just did. And, you know, Razi didn't know any better. And he went and gave him praise. <laughs> so the rabbi was like, ah, oh, no, you know, he's like, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it took away his mitzvah. <laughs> so it's like, uh, so, you know, as time goes on, we, we learn these states through, through the study. And his feelings were hurt, too. Uh -huh. <laughs> No, I'm number six. Number six. Well, what, what is that examination, right? It's telling me the examination is to look, am I receiving pleasure? Because we, we have in a constant like this, right? Every time we do something, we're checking what I'm getting, what's in it for me. Then if I stop doing this, if I'm able to stop, but I'm not checking, am I receiving a good state in the world? But I believe that I am working no matter what for Lishma. But in reality, the, uh, the, the, the God receive what I'm seeking. Then I have to go above the reason and believe that even if I am not really able to do for the sake of this door, he's still ready to receive what I am doing. But my work is still at that level. And even if it is not really, I have almost to be able to get into that concept. But then, because I connect to that, and I recognize that he is the one receiving and he is the one giving, then I am able really to be able to get uh, to get for Lishma. Uh, when one studies the Torah and one wants all his actions to be in order to bestow, one needs to try to always have support in the Torah. Support is considered nourishment, which is love, fear, elation, and freshness, and so on. And one should extract all that from the Torah. In other words, the Torah should give one these results. However, when one studies Torah, one does not have these results. It is considered, it is not considered Torah. It's because the Torah refers to the light clothed in the Torah. Meaning, as our sages said, I have created the evil inclination. I have created the Torah as a spice. This refers to the light in it, since the light in it reforms it. Um, so let's touch on that for a minute. I have created the Torah as a spice. This refers to the light in it. The light in the Torah reforms you. So say um, our bodies and our minds and our souls are like machines that haven't been built yet. What we do is we read these words and these words become energy and the energy emanates into uh, our light or whatever it is you want to call it. And in doing this, as we receive this input, um, the soul starts to build the Reshema of where we came from. And as we're building this desire, as we're building our soul, the parts to this engine or this machine start to get put back together in order to work properly. So uh, the more I read, once I get Shamati down, I've built a part of my machine. Once I get Tanya down, boom, I built a part of my machine. Once I get to uh, Zohar down, boom, I built another part of my machine. And as all of these things accumulate, Eventually, when time has come and I'm worthy to have a full machine built inside of me, I now have it. And you can use it as a, your Merkaba or whatever it is you want to talk about. But there's many different things and, and 
uh, ways we can we can word this. The words are infinite, but uh, for simplicity purposes, this is kind of what I'm using because it's it gives you an idea uh, of what we're doing. It tell me that when I study Torah, if I don't feel nourishment from it, if I just you know it's a labor, and I don't get nothing out of it, then it is not Torah. Because Torah. Is like what is telling me that I created the evil inclination, the will to receive, and I created Torah as a spice, which means the Torah is going to reform. The light of Torah is what reforming my will to receive to the will to bestow. It is that light. Oraha, the light, Torah, the, the teaching of the light, it's all those terminology. So when I study Torah and I get that nourishment, I get, draw the light out of it, I get the nourishment that is correcting my will to receive. Okay, where are we? Let's see. We should also know that the Torah is divided into two discernments. One Torah, two mitzvah. In fact, it is impossible to understand these two discernments. Before one is awarded, walking in the path of God by way of the counsel of the Lord is with them that fear him. It's so because when one is in a state of preparation to enter the Lord's palace, it is impossible to understand the path of truth. Uh, I'm sure we've all seen this with our family, for crying out loud. You know, you try to tell your family anything, and it's. Uh, I'm sure we've all dealt with that. <clears throat> However, it is, um, it is possible to give an example that even a person in a preparation period may somewhat understand it. It is, as our sages said, Rabbi Yosef said, a mitzvah protects and saves while practice, etc. The Torah protects and saves both when practice and when not practice. So, you know, that, that's what we're speaking about is well, the, the Torah is the light that is always there. The mitzvah is the deed, the action that is done according to the to the commandment. So when I am into doing a mitzvah, there is the say that when I'm doing a mitzvah, why I'm doing a mitzvah, I am protected. I have a shrena, I have a light of his presence within me. When I'm done with a mitzvah, I'm back to my regular which means when I'm in the mitzvah, I'm ungloved into the Oma Kif. But when I'm doing Torah, when I study Torah, I am, while I'm studying Torah, because it is also a mitzvah to study Torah, but it also permits me to be for all the time else. But so long as I am into the Torah, I am always protected. And that's why it's telling me that it's not, even when I'm not doing it, because I studied it, I carry that capability with me. I carry that light with me. That light is my nourishment. That's what we were speaking before. If I feel that nourishment, if I am getting from the Torah, then I really got the Torah, which is the light. The thing is that when practice refers to when one has some light, one can use this light that he has obtained only while the light is still within him. Now he is in gladness because of the light that shines for him. This is discerned as mitzvah, meaning that he has not yet been rewarded with the Torah, but elicits a life of Kedusha, sanctity, only from the light. This is not so with the Torah. When one attains in some way the work, one can use that. One can use the way that one has attained even when one is not practicing it. That is, even while one does not have the light, this is because only luminescence has departed from it, whereas one can use the way that one attained in the work even when the luminescence leaves him. All right, so does that make sense? What the thing? Let's say I'm learning something, right? I'm learning, let's say, a certain mitzvah into the Torah. So if I am practicing what I have learned, which means while I am doing it, I am getting the light. But even that now I am not learning Torah, if I leave what I have learned into the Torah, the light of the Torah is always with me. Even that the light of a of a deed of a mitzvah of study of Torah is no more within me because I am carrying what I have studied. I am living it. I am doing it. And that's what it is. Come on. There is a saying, Perke Avot, but who is deed is greater than his wisdom. Even there's another say, come on, there's many say, but there's one that who studied Torah, lo almanat lasot, not to, for the sake of doing, his Torah is levatala, is, is newly fied. But who studied Torah, for the sake of doing, is Torah, it's meraye, it's, it's alive. And that's what they're telling me here, in a sense, that if I study Torah for the sake of doing, but I will be able to do the mitzvah, the second part of the Torah, then my Torah is life. 
then I am always protected by the Torah, by my learning. Yes, awesome. Okay, so one little explanation I want to say. Um, uh, so with the thing you were just talking about, Philip, uh, this kind of pertained to, I remember talking to, having a conversation with Timur a little while ago, talking about my darkness being the light. So we come to a state um, uh, where the light leaves us, right? We, we feel like the light has left and we're in this state of suffering or what we perceive to be a suffering. Once we get past this state of um, being needy or wanting or whatever it is we're feeling and we realize I'm down, I'm in a depressed state. Once we realize it, that I feel like I'm in, a da- in, a, in the darkness, that's when you can start to realize your light because boom, immediately immediately follows that you have an opportunity to do work. So now that you have an opportunity to do work, this is when you're going to receive the most light. Um, So once you come to this state, there is no more darkness. You have completely just diminished all darkness because the light is in you at all times. It's your own jacked up perceptions that think you are in darkness. So theoretically, whether it be study, whether it be your prayer, you know, whatever it is, your girlfriend left, your boyfriend left, your dog died, all of these things. Once you realize all of these things are just Hashem, that's it. It's it's God pulling the strings. Seeing, oh, are you going to follow me now? I killed your dog. Oh, are you going to follow me now? I made your chick cheat on you or your man cheat on you or whatever. Oh, are you going to follow me now? I'm putting you through all these tests to see if you're still going to follow me or look for me. If not, I'm going to keep kicking your ass. If if so, then great. You know, this is the game. That's how he reveals the yeah, this is, corrections. This is the entire game of Kabbalah of life is this finding this out. And then once we've come to this, we're going to come to this state of being completely connected. Once we're completely connected, that's when we start this alchemy process of transmuting our inner soul and our inner fire, our inner metals into purity. And I'll wait for that later. But go ahead, Philip, finish up if you have anything. This is not so with the Torah. When one attains some way in the work, one can use the way that one has attained even when one is not practicing it. That is, even while one does not have the light, this is because only the luminescence has departed from him, whereas one can use the way that one attained in the work, even when the luminescence leaves him. Still, one must also know that while practiced, a mitzvah is greater than the Torah when not practiced. When practiced means that now one receives the light. This is called practice, when one receives the light in it. Hence, while one has the light, a mitzvah is more important than the Torah when one has no light, meaning when there is no liveliness of the Torah. On the other, on the one hand, the Torah is important because one can use the way one has acquired in the Torah. On the other hand, it is without vitality, called light. In a time of mitzvah, one does receive vitality, called light. Therefore, in this respect, a mitzvah is more important. And that's what I was talking about when I was speaking about the Pirkei Avot, the ethic of the fathers. That one, if I study Torah only for the sake of Torah, there is the, the other thing that I wanted to bring also was the, the one that his wisdom is greater than his deed, his wisdom is nullified. The one that his deed is greater than his wisdom, his wisdom is augmented, is, is put alive. And that's why they're telling me, uh, that, that's why the Mizvah is so much important, the deed. I have to do something. There is like in, uh, in the story with Abraham, when a- Abraham was sitting in front of his, uh, his, uh, his uh, tent after the Brit Mila, after the circumcision, it said that uh, the Shrina, God came to visit him, to appease him, as a, as a, as, as to, to talk with him. Then it said, and when he saw the three strangers coming, he told God to wait, and he's going to wait. So say, what what is this? Come on. I'm gonna say to the to God to wait when he's with me, and for us 
because three strangers are coming to my tent because it is more important even if I am doing something that is so-called in connection with God like prayer or meditation and there is an individual with a deed that I can do to do something for another it is greater than I stop my own meditation and my own prayer and I do what is necessary for the other Thus, when one is without sustenance, one is considered evil. This is because now one cannot say that the Creator leads the world in a conduct of good that doeth good. This is called that he is called evil, since he condemns his Maker, as now he feels that he has no vitality and has nothing to be glad about, so that he may say that now he offers gratitude to the Creator for giving him delight and pleasure. One cannot say that he believes that the Creator leads his providence with others benevolently, since we understand the part of the path of Torah as a sensation in the organs. If one does not feel the delight and pleasure, what does it give him that another person has delight and pleasure? If one had really believed that providence is revealed as benevolence to his friend, that belief should have brought one delight and pleasure from believing that the Creator leads the world in a guidance of delight and pleasure. If it it does not bring one liveliness and joy. What is the benefit in saying that the Creator does watch over one's friend with the guidance of benevolence? The most important is what one feels in one's own body, whether one feels good or bad. One enjoys one friend's pleasure only if he enjoys his friend's benefit. In other words, we learned that with the sensation of the body, the reasons aren't important. It is only important if one feels good. It's it's almost what you were saying before, uh, Anna, when you were asking if it is only in material things. My ear was telling me that indeed it's not only in where well, the bestow is not in giving things. It's also in recognizing that the goodness that happened to others is from his providence, is from his grace, is from the grace of above. And therefore, when I recognize this, I am really delighted and I'm getting the pleasure. And the same, the bestow become at that concept being happy for my friend is a part of a bestow no envy or, or anything of the sort you should be happy right mm -hmm. okay <clears throat> it in that state one says that the creator is good that doth good if one feels bad one cannot say that the creator behaves with him in a benevolent way thus precisely if one enjoys one's friend's happiness and receives high spirits from that and feels gladness because his friend feels good then he can say that the Creator is a good leader. If one has no joy, he feels bad. Thus, how can he say that the Creator is benevolent? Therefore, a state where one has no liveliness and gladness is already a state where he has no love for the Creator and ability to justify his Maker and be happy, as is appropriate with one who is granted with serving a great and important king. So this is also a part of another state. Okay, How many times have, have we, or you, or anybody, have purposely done something for somebody else just to bestow, and they look at you like you're nuts. Like, wait a minute. They don't want you to do anything good for them because now they feel shame and they feel like they're going to have to owe you, right? So we get to the state of this of the world, and uh, Tim kind of made me think of something when he was talking about that doing doing the deeds. So we all have this one body. And we're all parts of this one body. Um, we can call ourselves whatever. But um, all of us have a specific goal or, or whatever it is Hashem provided with us at birth, right? So Philip is <clears throat> a Torah scholar. Timur wants to just love everybody and be happy. <clears throat> I want to protect everybody. Anna's got a role, right? So we all have these specific roles, in this body and in order to complete the entire body we have to perfect our role and in order to do that we have to learn this 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 state this new state and so being um uh, if one feels bad one cannot say that the creator behaves with him in a benevolent way so the creator doesn't change okay it's just our perception that changes. So we need to keep scrutinizing this and understanding that we have to come to a realization that no matter what state we're at, we have to 
find that level of scrutinization to take our ego out of whatever situation it is and have a perfect intention for bestowal. Okay. Okay. <laughs> we must know that the upper light is in a state of complete rest and any expansion of the holy names occur by the lower ones. In other words, all the names that the upper light has come from the attainment of the lower ones. This means that the upper light is named according to their attainments. Put differently, one names the upper light according to the way in which one attains it, meaning according to one's sensation. If one does not feel the Creator gives him anything, what name can he give the Creator if he does not receive anything from him? Rather, when one believes in the Creator, every single state that one feels, he says that it comes from the Creator. In that state, one names the Creator according to one's feelings. If one feels happy in the state he's in, he says that the Creator is called benevolent, since that is what he feels, that he receives good from him. In that state, one is called Zadik, righteous, since the Matzdik justifies his Maker, who is the Creator. If one feels bad in the state he is in, one cannot say that the Creator sends him good. Therefore, in that state, one is called Rasha, evil, since he, Marcia, condemns his Maker. However, there is no such thing as in between. When one says he feels both good and bad in his state, instead, either one is happy or one is unhappy. Our sages wrote, the world was not created, etc., but either for the complete evil or for the complete righteous. This is because there is no such reality where one feels good and bad together. So this is where that state of perfectiveness comes in. <clears throat> There's no lukewarm in spirituality. Um, we, we know this. There's no course in this. So... You know, a lot of people can look and say, well, Hitler was evil. Hitler was bad. Yeah, but he was perfect. He was exactly right. He was exactly what he was supposed to be because he wasn't like a Bush. You know, President Bush wants to seem perfect, seem good, but is still a murderer. And so, you know, so these things are, are like Aleister Crowley, like like Hitler. We have completely, you know, the Ari. We, we, we have these people who are completely evil or completely righteous. You either accept it and move on, or, or you fig figure out how to correct it. And these are the states we're going through. Okay. So When our sages say that there is in between, it is that with the creatures who have a discern discernment of time, you can say in between, in two times, one after the other, as we learn that there is a matter of ascents and descents. There are, these are two times. Once he is evil and once he is righteous. But in a single moment, that one should feel good and bad simultaneously, this does not exist. It follows that when they say that Torah is more important than a mitzvah, it is precisely at a time when it is not practiced, meaning when one has no vitality. Then the Torah is more important than a mitzvah, which has no vitality. This is so because one cannot receive anything from a mitzvah, which has no vitality. But with a Torah, one still has a way in the work from what he had received while he was practicing the Torah. Although the vitality has departed, the way remains in him, and he can use it. There is a time when a mitzvah is more important than Torah, meaning when there is vitality in the mitzvah and no vitality in the Torah. Because it's the idea that a body without a soul is dead. So a mitzvah without the kavana, which is for the Shema, it's dead, it's just an action. And that's what they're telling me here. From the Torah, no matter even if I don't have the Shema when I study Torah, I am getting something into the study of Torah. But if I do rituals and vitality without really doing it for the sake of a commandment or the Shema, it is a dead thing. Thus, when not practiced, meaning when one has no vitality and gladness in the work, one has no other counsel but prayer. However, during the prayer, one must know that he is evil because he does not feel the delight and pleasure in the world. Um, although he makes calculation that he can believe that the creator gives him only good. Despite that, not all of one's thoughts, which one has, are true in the way of the work. In the work, if the thought leads to action, meaning a sensation in the organs, so that the organs feel that the Creator is benevolent, the organs should receive vitality and gladness from it. If one has no vitality, 
What good are all the calculations if now the organs do not love the creator because he imparts them abundance? Thus, one should know that if one has no vitality and gladness in the work, it is a sign that he is evil, because he is unhappy. All the calculations are untrue if they do not yield an act, meaning to a sensation in the organs that one loves the creator because he imparts delight and pleasure to the creatures.